So all day yesterday, there was a dream that kept, it was just in the forefront of my mind, a dream that I had had, I don't know, probably in 2022, early in the year. Um, I was looking for it in my journal today, and I came across some things, and everything started to gel. But last night, that I just was kind of thinking about that dream, trying to remember the details of that dream. But it was one of those dreams that, you know, stuck with me, and that typically is a sign of a God dream. Um, and the dream was, and I didn't understand it at all at the time, um, but the dream was, it had two scenes to it. The first scene, there was a girl laying across a horse, a big, strong horse, in a field, free and confident looking. I thought she was a model. And she was, um, but I was confused. I thought she was a model, actually, because um, somebody had a camera and they were filming her. And then in the next scene, I didn't see it necessarily as the same person, but there was another girl and I understood her to be a dancer and she was getting interviewed again in front of the camera. And there was a man standing behind her. She was sitting cross-legged on the ground and the ground beneath her was sinking. And she was just like trying to to do this interview and answer these questions, but she was sinking into the ground. And that was the dream. And um, now I can see, okay, that might have been two versions of me because there's a camera, right? And I've been in front of the camera. So I asked God last night, I'm like, God, what's the interpretation of that dream? Was that me? And he said that that dream revealed my two choices. Um, I can be sustained by him, or I can go back to the doctrines of man. I can listen to him and what he's telling me and speak his truth, and I can be supported by strength and be in that field free. And um, Or I can revert the man standing behind me represented the doctrines of man, and I can rely on that and try to answer from logic, and I can sink. And those are my choices. And um, I was like, okay, <laughs> because I was really wrestling, you know, with the message that he gave me and, and wrestling with the doctrines of man that I've heard and believed versus what he was telling me. And um, I didn't want to read this message. I was afraid, um, afraid of how it's going to make people feel because it's how it made me feel. And... Um, and he brought that dream to my memory, and he gave me the interpretation. So I am going to choose to be supported by him and sustained by him and trust him even when I don't understand everything. And my understanding is growing, um, but it's not, it's, it's just beginning in this new direction. So it's it's not matured. <laughs> um, but so I'm going to, so as, as I was looking through my journal to find that dream, I came across when my friend passed away that I explained in the previous video. The night, the conversation we had the night before he died. And, um, and then uh, three days before that, what I had journaled and the Psalms that I had written in, in my journal. So I'm gonna find that right now. So three days before my friend passed away, I uh, journaled a bunch of my favorite Psalms that were really standing out to me. And, um, I'm going to say what I journaled, and then you could look them up, but I'll read a couple. Psalm 19, Psalm 66, uh, 119, 89, 119, Psalm 119, 119, Psalm 138, Psalm 107, Psalm 107, 23. So Psalm 66 says, Praise our God, O peoples, let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let me ride over. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. Psalm 107, 23. Others went out in the sea ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. That entire Psalm of 107 is amazing, but this one spoke to my life directly. I read it actually when I gave my testimony on my wedding day. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. 
Let me start over. Others went out on the sea ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. I felt like in my life, I I was at a pretty high place in the world's standards. And um, I felt like, you know... I was living a pretty blessed life, and then I was plunged into the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end, and then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of elders. A few days later, um, I heard the idea that when Jesus was on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That he wasn't saying that God was forsaking him. He was pointing his disciples and the people seeking who he was and trying to understand who he was, he was pointing them to the scripture that prophesied those very words in Psalms that David wrote. And I'm going to read from that. And um, he's, he, that's recorded in the Bible. It points us to that same scripture too and what can be learned there. So I was exploring that idea that um that we've misunderstood that uh we sing about that that god turned his face away and i was wrestling with that because he says i will never forsake you will never leave you or forsake you so he forsake jesus his his beloved son on the cross he couldn't look at him because of sin what about in job you know it talks about like satan is going in and out of heaven you know asking for permission to do things on the earth. He's got legal rights. Um, it just wasn't adding up to me that uh, looking throughout scripture that he's had so much mercy and he just keeps calling and calling to his children. He had to be looking at their sin, trying to rescue them out of it. So I was just trying to resolve that in my mind and I was exploring that with my friend. And... Um, he was very, uh, you know, very solid on his beliefs that I was wrong about that. Um, you know, because all the biggest minds and quoting, you know, a lot of theologians and things of why, why, why Christians believe that, um, that God turned his face away as Jesus uh, became sin for man. And... Um, so I was listening to that, and we had a pretty, I would say not the prettiest conversation. Like we, I was, I don't even know why it was so sternly, so, I don't want to say sternly, but so like forthcoming in my presentation of why I thought that was a possibility, because I didn't even know if I believed that. I was just kind of exploring it through discussion. Well... When he passed away the next day, I was really worried that I got his heart, like his blood pressure up when we had this discussion. I've kind of carried that around and not told that to anybody, but um, I've wondered if, if that contributed. But now uh, I'm considering other things, but I'm going to read read that psalm that, um, that prophesied Jesus on the cross. So this is Psalm 22, right before the famous Psalm 23. Early in my journaling, um, before we knew my friend was really sick, um, I had been speaking in tongues and, and the Lord said, take this staff, it'll lead the way. And I learned that shepherds would journal by marking their staff every time God did something amazing in their life so they could look over their staff and look over the years and see the amazing things. And he also said when I spoke in tongues and then prophesied after, he said um, that 
take the staff to lead the way and um, that the journal would be a testament, my greatest testament in days to come. And I can certainly see that happening. Um, that same day that I got that, this friend would send me a daily verse. And guess what the daily verse was? It was Psalm 23 about the Lord is my shepherd. Um, so this is the Psalm right before Psalm 23. Psalm 20. Okay, I messed up reading that. So I'm going to start again. Okay, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me, from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their head. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Remember what was being said about Jesus? What they were mocking him with? Yet you brought me out of the, the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, but my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me, and they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and glow over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. I'm going to stop there for a moment. So a lot of people think that Psalms is just poetry and not really prophecy. I think this is pretty clear evidence that this is prophecy and something we need to pay attention to. This is what God, this is what Jesus on the cross is pointing us to. He wants us to understand this. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. Oh, my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. Did you hear that? He has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Our loving father did not turn his face away, and he doesn't turn his face away from us. That's how we feel. That's our flesh fearing. He doesn't forsake us. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to people yet unborn, for he has done it. So that's um, what I was wrestling with. There's a lot of doctrine, a lot of sound, believed to be very sound doctrine, and the churches 
we base our faith on that's a foundational truth that the Lord turned his face away because he's so holy he couldn't look at Jesus well that's not what that sounds like in Psalm 22 when you keep reading that's not what it sounds like so that's where the wrestling was okay and I just realized this this morning okay so I'm gonna to get to the message hold on just a moment okay before I get to the message when my friend passed away that night I had a very demonic dream that I was in this room it was an empty like college dorm room and I was being thrown around by a demon and the the ceilings were like tinted yellow like maybe somebody had smoked in that room or something and the demon was trying to kill me by pushing me up through the ceiling and now I'm sort of seeing I'm a I was trapped by my fear there was a pink song playing on the on the TV and the pink song that I know well I used to dance to a lot is um say something I'm giving up on you uh, I would have followed you anywhere you go I would have followed you and sometimes you know God is silent because he wants us to wrestle these things out because he's bringing things to the surface um, one of the Psalms he brings the dross to the surface he reveals the hearts of man through trials and tests um, and it's out of his loving kindness that he brings those things out so he can burn them off I think that's what that dream was about that I was um, I was trapped I was trapped in that room by a lie a lie it was empty and it was dark with demons you know there was no God there and they were trying to kill me and they were throwing me around um, but I was trapped in an empty room so I was just thinking about that I haven't really asked him for interpretation on that but I just saw it in my journal this morning I was kind of thinking about that all right, so here's the challenging message, June 3rd, 2023. My child, you do not need to fear. I am your loving Heavenly Father. Listen to me this morning. I want you to begin with a video about the lost. Call to them. Then I want you to post the one about the long-awaited appointment. Then you may tell them of the upcoming events. You can post them throughout this day. So that was my instruction for that day and videos. Okay, sorry about that. I was making sure this was the right message. I didn't remember that part. All right, hear me, O oh daughter. Can you begin to see a pattern? Look for a pattern hidden in your videos. I said, Lord, help bring it into my awareness. My child, you will soon see what it all means. I will show you the details that are hidden away. Follow my voice this morning. Stay with me. I am going to begin this lesson by, by telling you about the days to come. You will soon discover that the enemy is not really bringing the people to the foreground. I did not know what that meant. And I had um, some close friends, and one of them is my, my mentor, and I shared this message with her. Um, kind of, you know, just... You know, is this scripturally sound? And um, and because I don't know the scripture as well as, as some people. And I was asking her, what do you think that part means? The enemy is not really bringing the people to the foreground. And to her, it meant all the antichrists throughout scripture. They are brought forward. Um, not by the enemy to destroy, but the Lord is directing all of that. And uh, I'll explain why I think that is. The enemy is not really bringing the people to the foreground. He is simply a tool to reveal the hearts of man. Well, that's the reason God explained it. Um, he is simply a tool to reveal the hearts of man. So my question is, what if the enemy isn't the enemy of God? Like we, we know that he was defeated. Jesus defeated him. What if our flesh is the greatest enemy of God and he uses the enemy um, the accuser to bring the things of our flesh out so that we can reckon with them we can be accountable for them we can um, we can ask God 
to help us overcome them, but he's a tool to reveal to us what's already in our hearts. He is there to attempt to bring the hearts of man into account. I am going to show this to the world. They will see that man needed to be held accountable for what was already in his heart. Man was given a choice, and man desired to turn against God. All men have this tendency. Why do we have this tendency? He, this is what really bothered me. Like, God, you made us sick? Like, you made us sick so you could heal us? Like, why would you do that? Um, I have a psychology background, so I was just thinking of, like, you know, parents who made their kids sick so that they can, you know, be the hero and the caretaker. Um, so I was just like, God, what are you saying? Um, but we have this tendency, he made us in his image, you know, we can create, we can we have imaginations, we can, and those things lend toward us wanting to be our own God, okay? This is not a flaw in creation, he says. This is by design. I have done this in order that my name be lifted up, in order that man may know that I am God. In order that all people can see that I am who I say I am. Are you beginning to see, Melissa? At that time, I was not beginning to see. <laughs> Are you beginning to understand this mystery? Man was designed to be at war against me so that I may reveal myself to him in deeper ways. That was hard for me to swallow. How can a man who has no enemies understand love? How can a man who does not have any conflict understand the depths of my character? I am a God who saves. I am a God who restores. I am a God who desires mercy. I love to give good gifts to my children, and I love for my children to choose me above all else. This is how, how I am lifted high, and how I am discovered, and how I am seen rightly. Most do not understand this mystery. I hold it all, Melissa. I am testing the hearts of man so that they may see their need for a savior and a God. I am revealing their nature and their tendencies for rebellious, for rebellion, so that they might turn to me and be saved. Let me read that again. I am revealing their nature and their tendencies for rebellion, so that they might turn to me and be saved. This is the love I have desired for my people, to be their God, to be their provider, protector, sustainer, deliverer. I am not a God who desires to punish. I am a God who desires to save. But as I desire to be chosen, we have to have a free will or it's not love. How can a man have a choice if he is only one way? How can he choose between good and good? There is no struggle. There is only blessing. But how much more is that blessing when a choice is made against that which is not me? I am the Lord your God, Melissa. You have chosen me. You have turned to me in times of trouble. And did I not restore you? Did I not, retur did I not return you to me? Am I not your God and your closest friend? Melissa, I came for the lost. I died for the sinner so that I might be lifted up in all the earth. Sing to me a new song, Melissa, a new song of awareness, for I have loved the sinner since the foundations of the earth. I have decided this plan, and I have ordained that all would rebel and turn against me so that I may be mighty to save. I love my children, every hair on every head. But all have been given a choice as to whether or not they will receive that love. Their choice is a difficult one, so that I can receive the glory and honor that is due to me. I am not a God that I should be mocked or taken advantage of. I am a God mighty to save, and men are a reflection of this. They have given me praise and honor for the things I am able to do. Do not be dismayed by what I am telling you, because I was really struggling. I was kind of horrified. I am going to show you the ways in which this will all come to completion. I will show you why the end of all suffering is needed, why I will not go on with this plan forever, but it is just a part of the plan. The big picture is to allow the people to see in fullness and live in fullness of all I have for them. Restoration causes deep awareness and gratitude. It positions the receiver and the giver, and it reveals the heights and the depths of love I have for my children. There is nothing I would not do. How can the child who receives no discipline understand limits? 
How can he discover that I am without limits? Are you beginning to see? I am a God who is without end. I am he. Melissa began to understand how far and wide. The construct of time and limits are a lesson on revealing the magnitude of a God without limits. They are put into place for a time and a season to reveal my nature to my beloved children. They are a part of the experience to heighten awareness of who I am. This is for my good pleasure. I delight in astounding my children with good gifts. I delight in freeing them once they discover the choice and what I offer to them. I am a good God. I did this for fullness and completion. I did this for intimacy and knowing. I did this for my own glory and good pleasure. I am the Lord. How should I act? That reminded me, well, my friend reminded me of Job. When in Job, when God kind of corrected him and said, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there when I put the stars in the sky? Because I was questioning him. I was questioning his plan. Why would you do it like this? At some point, we all have to come to it. And you know what was reacting? My flesh. My flesh. The one that rebels and doesn't want to put him on the throne. He's God. He does get to choose. He has chosen. Will we choose him? He's chosen how the story begins and how it ends. Will we choose him and trust him? Will we trust he is who he says that he is? I was struggling with this. Um... How should I act? Do you approve? Some will not. Some will feel angry because I have made him rebellious. I am humble and gentle, but many will not be able to resolve this mystery in their mind. They will see me as a punishing and, de and desiring evil. I am light. I give light. In me there is only light. I illuminate. I reveal what is hidden. And I am everlasting love. This is not easy to digest in your stomach. You are not going to understand this immediately, but in time, this truth will be seen. You will grasp how deep and wide my love is for my chosen ones. I have loved you with an everlasting love and all will be completed. And I'm starting to see, God, what have you done? What have you done? This whole story, it is a story all of the details of all of this is just a desire to teach us about love and what it really means. The extent, the depth, the width that he is willing to go. <laughs> the story he's willing to write to help us to discover intimacy with him. Whew. I have loved you with an everlasting love and all will be completed. All that I have set into place will be completed and it will be good. It will be all that it was intended to be and it will be made complete. I said, search me, O oh God, and know my anxious thoughts. He said, daughter, this message is for the world. They will see the truth in this and they will desire to realize what I have for them is all that they long for. They will see that, they're, they, that, that they desire to escape this. Let me start again. They will see that they desire to escape this construct of time and desire to see the fullness of who I am and what I have waiting for those who humbled themselves and became like me, who chose to love through mercy, who chose to become small so that others could be lifted up. Did he not do this for us? Did he not become small to lift us up? Can we become small to lift him up? Isn't that a relationship? Isn't that love? This is profound. This is deep. This is to lift my children up, to bless them. I delight in doing this for them, to experience the fullness and completion of love, to rescue the lost and dying world is a revelation of my character. It is a way to see me. It is a desire, sorry, it is a design to be the lifter, to lower and to lift. This is love. I love you, my child. Go and deliver the other messages. I'll put the scripture in the notes. Ephesians 2.13 
Deuteronomy 6, 8, Hebrews 2, 1 through 7, Galatians, I have a question mark, 1, 8, Habakkuk, I wasn't sure if it was 2, 6 or 6, 2, so I'll put them both in there, Leviticus 2, 11, Song of Solomon 1, 15, the word Beatitudes came into my mind, Mark 8, 4, Psalms 22, 22, and finally Revelation 1, 8 through 16, or Revelation 16, I wasn't sure. Um, I wasn't sure if it's Revelation 1, 8 and chapter 16, or Revelation 1, 8 through 16, so I'll look, look at that and see. Some notes I wrote down, in this message, there's a sense of loyalty. He wants to be clung to. He chose us above all else. The angels say, and, and uh, man says, who, who is man that you would be mindful of him? He chose us. Will we choose him? There's a sense of loyalty there. Um, there's also what came to mind this morning. When he, and there's something to, it was 1.14 in the morning, and I went and I looked up Genesis 1, 1 through 4. I just felt like that's what I was supposed to do. And um, it talks about when he separated the light from the darkness. That was part of his plan from the very beginning. Light, he's light. To him, there's no darkness. Because, you can think about what that means. Right now, what that means to me is, Wherever he is, his light penetrates the situation, and it makes the darkness flee. But also, he sees all things as working together for good. He uses, as a tool, the darkness to illuminate the light. There's a contrast that has to exist for light to exist, for darkness to exist. They have to coexist to exist. It's kind of like when I teach dance. I teach, in order to show that something's quick, you've got to put something slow before it. There's got to be a contrast, otherwise it just looks all the same. In order for something to look slow, you've got to put something quick in front of it. So that there's got to be a contrast. So I understand that, that concept. In the beginning, he separated the light from the darkness. The enemy's allowed to work in the darkness. He's got rights there. Darkness tends to mean ignorance. So God is trying to show us, I believe, in this. He's in it all. He's holding it all. He will never leave us or forsake us. But he's using some of these things to reveal the tendencies of our flesh. He uses the storms. Somebody said, well, Jesus rebuked the storm. So if God created the storm, why would he rebuke himself? Well, that was part of our discussion last night. We're trying to resolve that, okay? If, if, if what God's saying here is true, well, guess what? When I looked in my journal, I had journaled a few days before the storm, before Barry passed away, that he, he caused, he stirred up a storm. And the people rose to the top and they sunk to the bottom. And then when they cried out, he calmed the storm. What did the storm reveal to the disciples on the boat? What did it reveal about their nature? What did it reveal about their hearts? He had just finished preaching about the seed. There's something to that. I journaled about that. I talked to my friend about that. I said, you got to pay attention. He was in the hospital. I'm like, there's, I just woke up in the middle of the night. I'm like, I know there's something to this. I know there's something about how the order of these things. The seed being scattered reveals the soil you know when the seed is planted it reveals the conditions of the soil reveals the conditions of the heart so then the disciples what was the condition of their heart lord don't you care about us isn't that what we say every time that there's a storm lord where are you don't you care if we drowned that's what i say lord don't you care that's where my heart goes that's where my flesh goes no there's there's a principle about God that can be applied in all situations. He will never leave us or forsake us. He is using that storm to reveal the lies that we believe. He brings them to the surface. He said, oh, you have little faith. 
Do you still not see? Do you still not believe? The same person that created the storm to reveal, who used it as the tool, maybe the enemy did it, I don't fully understand this yet, but he used it as a tool. He was in control of it. He knew what he was doing. Put them in that appointed time with that storm to reveal the fear they had in their hearts so he could show that who he was, who his character is. He's the one when you cry out, he answers. I hope you're seeing this. This is huge. I believe all of this is happening, maybe for the people that are left behind, that they can understand what's happening to them, that God is creating whatever the tribulation looks like, the big storms. That's what it's going to take for them to turn out of his mercy and love. He's giving them another chance for harvest, to harvest them to see that those were the perfect conditions he's the he's the farmer he knows the perfect conditions that it takes for something to grow what does it take what do you put on a garden to make it grow <laughs> what is fertilizer what is it he knows he knows the conditions he knows the amount of poop that it takes he he knows and he's a good God and he is giving people chances to see him who he is but I don't think we've understood him rightly and I think he's trying to get us back on track to that and so you know maybe these messages somehow reach the people after the rapture or something and and they can see that in his mercy they can trust him because oh they didn't choose him they they didn't choose the intimacy that he desired. They didn't. And this goes back to my friend. Why did we have that conversation the day before he passed away? What if when he was walking to go get lunch, even though he resisted it like I did, resisted it? What if he saw that all of it that he went through, God was holding it in his hand out of his mercy. He 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 realigned him correctly that God is due the glory and praise. He is the giver of life. He is the breath in our lungs. He sustains our lives. He that's where my friend arrived. You know, he he abided with him more deeply through all of that storm. He understand understood his Lord and the sovereignty and understood him as the giver of life more profoundly when he couldn't breathe. And what if when he was walking to get lunch, he saw God didn't forsake him. It was all to get him into a place of real intimacy and loving and a right understanding of, of what this is all about, this construct that he's made. Before we arrive in our glorified bodies, that we choose him to lift him up in the place that he deserves by making ourselves low, just like he lowered himself to lift us up. And we walk in this love journey together. What if this is what all of this is? What if that is what the enemy's purpose is? And that's why he gets eventually thrown into the lake of fire and he's no more is to make us accountable for our flesh and reveal what's in our flesh when we have a choice. That we choose each other. He chose us, we choose him. I don't know. This is a really long video. I hope you stuck in there with me. But I'd love to hear your feedback. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, maybe you already knew this. For me, this was really, really profound. All right, God bless you. I hope this blesses you. I hope this takes you into deeper waters with the Lord and into deeper levels of trust as the season approaches. We understand what this is all about. This is an incredible love story. I wanted to add one piece when I later sought the Lord on the, the situation with the boy that was shot. And I said, Lord, why did, why did you allow that to happen? What was supposed to happen? He said, Melissa, I was just showing you what is possible if people will listen to my voice and not doubt me.
just wanted to show that to you. <laughs> he knew I wasn't going to make it there. He knew I was going to doubt him. But he took me on that journey. So I could tell you about it. And um, so we can go into deeper levels of faith with him. And uh, intimacy with him. And uh, go into this next season with Holy Spirit power and uh, solid faith. All right, God bless you. Okay, so just in case the main point, I think, of all this, or one of the main points is God desires to heal the whole person, not just our physical ailments. It's important to recognize that we are spirits having a physical experience. We're not physical beings having a spiritual experience. We are first spirits. And he wants to heal our whole person. So he knows the right conditions. You know, he's talked about that in other messages as being the farmer and making plants grow. He knows the right conditions for that, for growth. He knows the right conditions for our healing. And that's what this is all about is being healed from our tendencies to become our own God and um, things that stand in the way and our barriers. He wants us to keep our wicks trimmed and our oil lamps full. He wants to keep the our accounts short with him. He wants to remain um, our God. He wants to be recognized as our God, um, but he loves us. He does it to reveal what love is. We are created to love him. That's what heals us. When we understand him rightly, we're created to love him. And so he wants to heal the whole perfect person with his love. And he knows the conditions um, for which that takes place. So I just made, wanted to make sure that that point came across. I'm not sure if it did or not. All right. Thank you. God bless.